First off, how about those Bulldogs yesterday, huh? Woo! Man, that was good. Ed Dunkel, were you there? I had a sneaky, I looked for you in the crowds, but I couldn't pick you out of all the red, all right? Uh, I got to tell you, when they called that touchdown a fumble in the end zone, I thought, we're doomed, man. This is going to be a train wreck the rest of the game. And it was awesome. All right, got that out of my system. Um, now, a lot of you have asked about donuts, okay? I'm surprised I don't smell like a donut today, okay? It, it is in my clothes. It's in the garage. It kind of permeates the house. Several of you have volunteered. Thank you for the help that you've given. Last night was a record night. We sold 260 dozen donuts last night, all right? That is a bucket load of donuts. Uh, for those of you who may new or guests here, you're saying, what in the world is this donut thing? We, uh, Shelly and I live in the Christmas tree candy cane lane area off of Peach and Alluvial, and so thousands of people come by our house every night during this time. And uh, we thought, how could we help our Build the Barn Fund and so we are selling donuts every night. I got to tell you, we did not think this through all the way when we had the idea. Uh, somehow the five hours every night, all right, did not quite register of what that meant. But uh, uh, many hands have helped make it a lot easier. We've got some ideas for next year when we do it. Uh, but um, it's, it's going very well. Some of you saw the Channel 24 News, all right. They came out three times in one night. Uh, they were very nice and gracious. I thought it was one of the best spots I've ever been interviewed for, though I always tired to tell them, I have a face for radio. You should not put me on TV. Um, but anyway, they were there, and the cameraman came a third time in the last 20 minutes, and he said, Tim, I came back because I need to end my night on a good note. He said, since we left here earlier, he said, I was called to a house fire, I was called to a car chase, and I just left a stabbing. And he said, I needed to end my night on a better note. So we gave him a dozen donuts, all right? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, maybe we bribed the press. I don't know. But anyway, they did a great job. And then last night, we probably had close to a dozen people who came through, and they said, we're here because we saw it on the news. We want to help out. So that was very nice. We've had a chance uh, because almost everybody who buys, we point to the picture, which is out in the foyer. We had a banner made that hangs from our garage door, and we point to it and say, hey, thanks for buying the donuts. You're helping us build the barn at our church. And that has spawned some interesting dialogue. Some have asked what time services are, some where we're located. Some tell me more about your church. One, one family said, we're new into town. We're looking for a church. They might be here right now. I won't make you raise your hand. But anyway, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And we've, uh, we've got, what, eight days, left, nine days left, I guess? So uh, pretty exciting time. So thanks for uh, praying for us, and thanks for many of you volunteering to help us out. We will uh, we'll have donuts here uh, the last Sunday of the year, all right? We'll actually have the machine here. So you can get donuts in between services if you would like, and all of it goes to Build the Barn. Speaking of donuts, last Sunday of Build the Barn, uh, here's what's going to happen. December has five Sundays in it this month. Pastors love five Sunday months. One extra offering for the month, all right? Well, this means one extra for the year, all right, in December. It kind of comes that way this year. Here's what we're doing. You all have been so gracious. We have already met our budget expectations for the year. So the last Sunday offering of the year is all going to go to the barn. Okay, so some of you are saying, Tim, I've already given my, uh, you know what, just think about a little extra, a little Christmas gift at the end of the year, but whatever comes in and that last Sunday's offering, and, and I, I wish I could tell you that this was for sure yet, I don't know, I'm working on a plan that maybe we might have matching donations for the last Sunday contributions, Okay. That's not, that's not nailed down yet, but something that, that's in the works. So uh, we'll let you know about that by next Sunday, but uh, that would be pretty exciting for us. I can tell you where we are in our fundraising and contributions for the barn. We now have exceeded $865,000, all right? So about $65,000 came in this week. So we are very, very grateful for that. Um, let me get all this barn stuff out of the way right now. All right, most of you know who've been here for a few weeks, uh, the beard uh, is something new. I'm always a mustache goatee guy. The beard is new. 
That will be shaved off when we hit a million dollar target, all right? Our goal is 1.5. As soon as we get to the million, the beard, the goatee, the mustache, it all comes off for one week. <laughs> one week, all right? Uh, <clears throat> somebody at our board, at, at our business meeting uh, two weeks ago, they wanted to know what would it take for us to shave your head? <laughs> that has never happened in my lifetime. The closest was flat top, the last one I had when I was seven years old, all right? I really believe that God made very few perfect heads and all the rest of them he put hair on and mine is one of those. Uh, so, uh, during that business meeting, this doesn't sound very spiritual at all, but during that business meeting, this conversation came up. So here's the deal. If we hit 1.2 million in pledges by the end of this year, that means you got two and a half weeks. It'll all come off. It'll all come off. All right. John Longstaff even threw his big fat head into it, all right? So uh, it would be both of us shaved, all right, from, uh, from the neck up, okay, for one week. And then I'm going on vacation, all right? Now, guys, enough foolishness. Let's, let's direct your attention to the screen, get into our morning announcements. Good morning and welcome to New Hope. We're so glad you're here today. If you're a visitor, we'd like to hear from you. Please use the Connect card in the pew in front of you and give us your information. We promise not to come knock on your door, but we would like to send you some information about us in the mail. We're honored that you joined us today. And if you're not a visitor, but you're a member, we'd also like to hear from you. If you have prayer requests or an address change, use the same Connect card. Thank you, and we're glad you came. Good morning, church. I would really enjoy getting together with you on a personal basis whether for medical issues you might have, we could pray about, or personal concerns, or any other reason. I would love to have the opportunity to meet with you anytime. You may even know someone that you would like for me to visit. I'd be glad to do that. My email and phone number are on the church website. Or you can call Angel in the office and she will give you my information. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to visiting with you very soon. God bless. Good morning, ladies. We have some exciting things coming up for you in 2019. We're developing several clubs for you, and the first one up is a book club. There's more information on that later, and we'll have a meeting. But what I'd like from you today is if you're interested in being one of the hostesses to one of the book clubs, because we'll probably have several of them, please email me on our church website and I'll be in touch with you. Thank you for considering this wonderful ministry. We're gonna have a great time. Let's all get involved. On January the 6th is our first Sunday of the month evening service. It's at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary. It's a family style service and we have communion. For the start of the new year, we'll be starting with the Daniel plan. This is a Bible study that we'll be studying on Wednesday nights, but the kickoff is on the Sunday night service. So if you're interested in learning more about what the Daniel plan is about, it's about faith, food, fitness, friends, and focus, then it's a great time to start off the new year with this Bible study. See you at 5 p.m. January the 6th. We just want to let you know about all the Christmas services that are coming up this month. On the 16th of December at 5 p.m., we have a special production of the Kids Play. That'll be the Christmas Express. So that's in the Sanctuary at 5 p.m. on the 16th. For our Christmas services on December 23rd, we're starting in the sanctuary at 7.45, and then there's the 9.15 and the 11 o'clock service. The Christmas choir will be singing in that service, so come along and get in the Christmas spirit. This Christmas Eve, we have two services. The first one is at 4 p.m., the second one is at 9 p.m., and it's come as you are, dressed however you like, whether you're dressed to the nines or you're still wearing your pajamas. Come along and join us for Christmas Eve at New Hope. Calling B37, mark your cards. Let's play bingo, B37. Hi everyone, this message is for our seniors, prime timers, and you who are over the speed limit peeps. Join us Tuesday, January 8th for our seniors lunch. It's potluck style and bingo. Sign up sheets coming soon. Hi, 
right, so that's all of our announcements, and uh, most of those are also listed in your bulletin, so you can go home and put them on your calendar. Don't forget today, 5 o'clock, uh, there is a caveat to the Christmas Eve service announcement where it says, uh, come as you are in your pajamas. That, that includes a robe. All right, you must have the robe on if you come in your pajamas, all right? Uh, after the service today, uh, you're going to see Tom Shasky out there at a set of tables. Uh, he is selling Shasky Farm nuts today, and that is a fundraiser for our uh, high school camp, winter camp that's going on. So uh, if you need a few more nuts around your house, uh, stop and pick some up. There are all kinds of flavors. They're very good, and uh, it will help some of our kids uh, make an easier time of going to camp. The tables are also out there for the uh, prison fellowship gifts. And so uh, if you forgot yours, please see Janice at those tables. Make arrangements of how all of that is to take place. All right. Uh, let me highlight now a few prayer requests. Uh, Reba Chamberlain, who broke her second hip the day after Thanksgiving, has now finished her two weeks at skilled nursing through lots of physical therapy. She is being transported this morning, maybe even during this service, to uh, the place that she called home before she broke her hip, the other hip, the second time, back to Apricot Mornings, not far from our house, and she is doing very well. Woody Imke, uh, been part of our church family for many years, uh, sets about three rows from the back, usually in the uh, 11 o'clock service. Uh, he is uh, a candidate for hospice now. They were to do an evaluation on Friday. Do you know if they got there late Friday afternoon? Okay. All right. So uh, be praying for them as they're going through this transition in their life. Virginia's there taking good care of them. Uh, Dave Wildy, uh, Dane Wildy is going to be having heart surgery two days after Christmas up in the Bay Area. He would appreciate you remembering to pray for him. Nancy Kraus is also scheduled for surgery this month, so please be praying for them as they're awaiting surgery that they experience God's peace. Uh, Grace Garza, who's in our service right now, her son Jason is going to be having a heart procedure this Tuesday. He's 45 years old. Would appreciate us remembering to pray for Jason. Uh, let's see here. Then we got Dan, who uh, had another chemo treatment this past week, Dan Sullivan. Uh, so when he has a procedure like that on Wednesday, it's usually the weekend, he's at his worst, and he begins to improve a little bit uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Dan had the opportunity to come by in their uh, new car with the family and get donuts the other night, and it was so good to see him out there, and I walked over to his door and I said, Dan, I'm not going to tell you you look good because you're tired of hearing that from people. So here's what I'm going to tell you. You look a heck of a lot better than you did two weeks ago. <laughs> and he did. He looks absolutely terrific. He's had a couple of appointments where they have evaluated the markers of how well the treatment is working, and both of them have been very, very positive. And so we are so grateful for the good news there. Continue to pray for strength and stamina. His regret today is he won't be able to be here tonight to see his two girls in the program. So we are videoing, all right, to make sure that happens, and he'll get a chance to see it then uh, once it's over. Irma continues to uh, improve after the uh, treatment that she had up in Stanford. She might make it out to our last service. She may sneak in late and leave a little bit early. She still uh, is very cautious because there's so much uh, flu bug and cold out there. That's where Shelly is home with a, a cold today. And uh, we appreciate you praying for both of them. Uh, let's see here. Ziva Hammock, which is on our recent prayer concerns list. She'd been under hospice care. She no longer has a need of hospice care. She has seen heaven for the first time. I would love to know her thoughts about that. And services have not yet been scheduled. Uh, Robert Crenshaw and Fran Reed were memorial services we had this past week. Would appreciate you remembering both of those families. The Crenshaw family, it's, uh, this is one of those God wink families in my life. Uh, I met the first part of this family 25 years ago at a wedding when uh, Cecil uh, was not able to uh, fulfill a commitment he had made to marry them. He had to go out of town, got a call at the last minute. Um, from that wedding, I met the Sharton family. From that wedding, I did about eight other weddings and a few other funerals, and so had a chance to reconnect with them. Uh, some of them in that family uh, have not yet opened the Christmas gift in their world. And so it was another chance to challenge them, and I was so grateful for that. Um, it's uh, continue to pray for the McLannan family and part of their family. Uh, her Sherry's family are with us today. So continue to pray for God's best and God's encouragement in their lives. They would appreciate that so much. Uh, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward as we receive our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? And then Tim Kepler is here today and is going to lead us in our worship. Let's pray. 
Father, I love you so much. I'm grateful for the life and the strength that you provide to each of us. I'm grateful for the joy that you bring into our life, even in other seasons besides Christmas. I'm grateful that you offer to us and make, uh, make available to us a peace that passes human understanding, a peace that is functional in our lives when all the circumstances in our world dictate that we ought to be troubled and worried and afraid. And yet you say in the midst of the storm, you have a peace that brings us calm. Paul said not only does it calm us down, but even in the midst of the storms, in a prison cell, we can find contentment in the peace that you provide. And so for those who are here today, Lord, some are going through some storms. Some of them are their physical challenges. Some of them are, are, are family matters. Some of them are, are, are um, financial in nature. Storms come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. But Father, it's not the storm that determines our peace. It is your Son, our Savior. And so, Father, if we haven't learned that yet, I pray that there will be something said either in the music, in the prayers, or in the message today that, that, that pokes and prods and encourages us to know that you have a peace and a joy that is not dependent upon anything but a healthy relationship with you. And, Father, it doesn't take long periods of time to get healthy and right with you. It takes a singular moment that says, God, I'm sorry. I've done it my own way. Even as a Christian, I've tried to work my way out of this own plan or predicament. I've, I've tried to make myself feel joy. Lord, I'm ready to give up on that. I'm ready to say, God, I can't. I'm sorry that I ever thought that I could do this on my own. But I know you can. You always said you would. And I'm ready to let you right now. Thank you, Father, for helping us learn that lesson a little more today. Thank you for your care for this church. We are so grateful. We continue to trust you with our needs as a church body. Thank you, Father, for the direction that you've provided us as we build the barn. We didn't jump into this quickly. We haven't done it foolishly. We've sought your guidance and leadership every step of the way. Thank you for those who have given already and those who have pledged to give. And Father, thank you for nudging those who are still in a season of contemplation about how and, and what it is that we're going to share and give. And so we thank you for this in advance. That's what trust is, saying thanks in advance. We commit all this to you in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. I invite you to turn to John chapter 3. It's where we'll be reading from in a few minutes. Before I get to John 3, um, first off, I want to say thanks to Mark. I had calls and emails and texts after last Sunday's service that Mark knocked it out of the park last Sunday morning. So big thanks to Mark. I love that guy. It's terrific having him here. Um, several of you asked about my trip. Uh, the trip went really very well. Um, I was there for a two-day uh, board meeting with 1040i. Uh, the missions organization that we go to Africa with. And so there are some exciting things on the horizon that are taking place with 1040i. It was a very, very good meeting with them. Um, I also went to see my son, my oldest son, Brant. Some of you know, remember, uh, he's now living in Oklahoma, just moved about three weeks ago, uh, about a month ago, to Ardmore, Oklahoma. It's about as close to Texas as you can get without being in Texas. Uh, so he's an Okie. He is... Um, He's, he's very, very excited that his uh, great-grandfather's Indian blood has now given him free fishing and hunting license for the rest of his life in the state of Oklahoma. So that thrills him a lot. Uh, he is engaged in a church there. Uh, I've requested prayer from you uh, a little about, about a year ago, uh, visited that location. Um, it has a brand new building, less than five years old, but... Um, um, through a series of unfortunate circumstances of um, a pastor retiring and two pastors that followed weren't interested in building a church. It's down to about 30 people. I preached there last Sunday morning. There were 28 there uh, in a sanctuary that seats about 100 more than this one does. It's beautiful, except for the color scheme. I think the people were colorblind when they put together their interior design. Uh, or they really loved purple, all right? Because there's a lot. My sister would be very happy there because there's a lot of purple. 
but uh, a really a great place. It's, uh, the name of it now is called Hilltop Church, and uh, they're trying to launch in a new way, and Brant is already plugged in. Corey, you'll find this very interesting. He is now scheduling a regular men's monthly breakfast that he's going to be leading. So big step for my oldest boy, all right? Um, and then I will also tell you I snuck in two days of pure delight for myself. Um, only because the travel company sent me a notice that if I would stay two days longer, they would cut $160 off my round-trip airfare. I figured, why not? And so uh, I know this may be repulsive to some of you, and I'm sorry, but I spent two days pheasant hunting. To those of you who might find that repulsive, I can tell you I missed both shots that I had, okay? So um, that's the way that... No, what are you clapping for that I missed? All right, uh, but it was great fun being out. The temperature was 17 degrees in Kansas with a 20-mile-an-hour wind, all right? It was pretty chilly, uh, but it was great fun. I uh, tell you what, God knows what he's doing when he put creation together, and there's some awesome sights out there. All right, enough of all of that. Um, you couldn't have picked a better song uh, right before today's message that it's all about Jesus. We've been looking over the last few weeks, first couple of weeks of the month as we uh, contemplated Christmas coming at the unopened gift. That's the sign up there. We've looked at how the unopened gift often is neglected. It's underappreciated. And yet Paul describes it in his writing in the book of Corinthians as God's unspeakable gift. And it should be unspeakable, but it ought not to remain unopened. We'll continue with those thoughts today. One family was preparing for a very large Christmas Eve gathering. The mother had been giving out orders that day in preparation for that evening like she was a drill sergeant. Pick up your things. Don't get your clothes dirty. Don't touch that. Put away your toys. Well, her, none of you have ever done that, I'm sure. All right. Her four-year-old daughter had been underfoot all day. So mom sent her daughter to the next room to play with her wooden nativity set. As the mother scurried around setting the table for dinner, she overheard her daughter talking to her toys in the same tone of voice that her mother had been using. I don't care who you are. Get those camels out of my living room. <laughs> but I will suggest to you for years now, in fact, most of my lifetime, and as of Friday... I have one more year of Medicare-free living. And for most of my lifetime, there have been many, many attempts to get more than camels out of the living room at Christmas time. You see, there has been this repeated and I believe even concerted intentional effort to get Christ out of Christmas. Everything from removing Christmas carols from public schools as much as possible to banning nativity scenes on public property to taking the name of Christ out of any connection with Christmas in public life. There's been this persistent and unrelenting push for decades now to remove any influence that God may have in this very special holiday. I am so glad that the movement of about five or six years ago to stop saying Merry Christmas and to say Happy Holidays, I'm glad that that pretty much has failed. I don't hear that very often anymore in the stores or in the neighborhoods I go in. I love on our street hearing all of the children whose heads are sticking out of the roofs of their parents' cars. Sometimes half a leg or an entire leg is hanging out a window, all right? They're straddling the door window. Clovis Police was one time asked by some of the neighbors a few years ago if they could have a presence in the neighborhood just to keep things under control, and they said, you don't want us in your neighborhood. We would have to nail down every offense then that we see, and there are a lot of offenses, all right? People being hauled in trailers, all right? But it's cool. But there's so much fun hearing the children, especially if they're missing a couple of teeth, say Merry Christmas as they drive by. There is just something extra special about that. It was back in 1991, 27 years ago, when Dave Barry, a, a writer, commented on the effect that this phenomena of getting Christ out of Christmas was having in the state of Florida where he lived. And he wrote these thoughts. He said, to avoid offending anybody, 
my son's school has dropped religious themes altogether and now they only sing about the weather they hold their winter program in February and they sing such songs as winter wonderland frosty the snowman and he said there's a real song out there I didn't know about Susie snowflake all of which he says is pretty funny because we live in Miami Frosty the Snowman, Susie the Snowflake, Winter Wonderland in Miami. He said a visitor from another planet would assume that our children belong to the Church of Meteorology. The effort to remove Christ from this holiday season has been a fair amount of success to it. According to a survey conducted a few years ago by Barna Research Group, Barna in the church world is the equivalent of Gallup in the secular world. They're a very, very good research organization. And a few years ago, um, with 88% identifying themselves as Christians in the sampling group that they tested for this survey, here were their results. 37% of adults in the national survey said that the birth of Jesus is the most important aspect of Christmas. 37 percent that means 73 percent do not see Christ as a central part of Christmas more than 75 percent of the evangelical Christians place Jesus birth as a first importance on Christmas that sounds pretty good doesn't it 75 percent no it sounds horrible these people identify themselves as evangelical Christians and one-fourth of them say Christ is not the most important part of Christmas. 32% of those who identified themselves, this one I scratched my head over, 32% of those who identified themselves as fundamentalists gave that answer. That meant then that 68% of those who say they're very conservative in their theology did not put Christ as most important at Christmas time. 29% of those who say they were members of the Catholic Church Place Jesus' birth first. 24% of theological liberals, these are people who say they've studied the Bible a lot. They're theologically educated. Only 24% of them say that the birth of Christ made Christmas important to them. There was a television interviewer who was walking the streets of Tokyo at Christmas time. Just like in America, the holiday season of Christmas is a big commercial success in Japan. The interviewer stopped one young woman on the sidewalk as she was going from one store to the next and asked, Ma'am, what is the meaning of Christmas? Laughingly, she responded, I don't know. Is that the day Jesus died? See, Christ is dead to so many people. Christ is not a part of of their Christmas he is not the center of it all it's just another holiday season to them it's nothing more than that it's the trappings and the treasures of life it's the the parting and the presence it's an unopened gift but it is not the person of Jesus I'm not really sure how concerned those of us in the church ought to be about that some of you might be surprised that I made that statement. Let me blow your mind with another statement. Christmas is not a Bible-based holiday. You don't find in this book anything that says we ought to celebrate Christmas. Oh, the first century church, they didn't celebrate Christmas. What they did celebrate was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, communion as often as they wanted to. They celebrated his resurrection from the dead every Sunday morning because now they gathered on the first day of the week. But it didn't take a thousand years for the church to decide we need to celebrate his birth. It's not found in the Bible. But the celebration of Christmas was developed a little over a thousand years ago. 
The church decided we'll celebrate the birth of Christ, the one who died and rose again from the dead. Because just a side note, and you've heard me say it before, folks, if it wasn't for the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, nobody would celebrate Christmas. There would be no reason to. For the crucifixion would just have been the death of a heretic. And his birth would be nothing to remember. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that validates the birth in Bethlehem. After all, it is in the story of the baby that's found in the manger that we hear about the greatest gift that man has ever received, presented in the most humble of wrappings, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Given that God has offered to us such a lavish lasting and loving gift how can we make other people know more about this gift that represents us so much I think the first thing that we need to realize about this dilemma is that people really do have trouble understanding the gift that God has given to them they're accustomed to work and to play and to family and to life and to think about death and what comes after death does not come easily to most of us. Let's read John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Follow along with me if you would. Now there was a man of the Pharisees. Let me pause. Pharisees and another group called Sadducees were the leaders of the Jewish faith and religion. They were the most educated, well-taught, and they then became the teachers to the people of the Old Testament truths and principles. They knew the law backwards and forwards. They knew it so well, in fact, they thought they could write laws of their own. They also were the ones who knew all the prophecies of the coming Messiah, and they were the, they were the watchmen that were supposed to be looking for the signs that the Messiah had come, and there was going to be a change in the world. So that's who this guy is that shows up. A man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He had power, he had position, he had knowledge. And he came to Jesus at night. Now what was this guy's name? Yeah, this is the first episode of Nick at Night. Some of you have heard that so many times you're sick of it, all right? He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with them. Notice something interesting. This Pharisee, who knew the prophecies of the Messiah, saw a parallel between them and Jesus. But notice something else. He didn't whisper a word of it to the other Pharisees. I don't know if it was out of fear. I don't know if it was out of intimidation. But this Pharisee says, I see something in this man that looks like a Messiah. And he sneaks to him at night and he asks his question. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There's a whole lot in this one verse. Unless a person, a man, a woman is born again, they will not be a part of and will never see the kingdom of God. What does all that mean? That connects God of creation and God of the Old Testament to the sitting Messiah in front of Nicodemus. Nicodemus knew the Old Testament well. He knew that God had shaped and formed man out of the dust of the earth. But until God breathed into him his own very own life, he was just a lump of clay. Jesus was telling Nicodemus, Nick, you're just a lump of clay until you're born again. It was prophetic in the sense that later on the scripture would say that we are born dead in our trespasses and sins. We must be born again with what? With the very life and presence of God in us. And then Nick really 
I, I know there is no such thing as a stupid question, except for the one you don't ask, but this one was pretty stupid. This very brilliant man looks at Jesus and says, how can a man be born again? Surely I can't enter a second time in my mother's womb. I got to be honest, that's a dumb question. But Jesus answered, dummy. No, no, he didn't. It, 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 that's not him red. All right, that's not him red. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Unless a man is born of water, physical birth, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, water, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Nick, you've studied the prophets. You shouldn't be surprised by this. You saw enough to come and talk to me. You ought to know better than this. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. He asks another question. How can this be? Jesus is probably thinking, wow, this is what qualifies to be a Pharisee these days. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. <laughs> I think this was a smackdown. <laughs> You're a teacher, Nick. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who has come from heaven, the Son of Man, and that is Jesus. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. Just in case some of you don't know that story. The children of Israel had been very rebellious. God sent snakes in their midst to bite them and they were beginning to die. The people came to Moses and cried out, Moses, save us. Moses went to God on their behalf. God said, take a serpent and put it on a pole Lift it up in the midst of the people and tell the people to look and then live. Do you know what the sign for the medical profession is, the symbol on their code? It is the serpent on the pole taken from that story, look and live. And the scripture says, until Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, be lifted up, you and I can't look and live, but we must look to the one who's been lifted up on the cross and in his death for us we find our life just as Moses lifted the snake in the desert so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life Wow you can almost sense Jesus frustration with Nicodemus you're a teacher and you can't understand Nicodemus, one of the most educated in his world, and yet he had trouble figuring out what Jesus was trying to teach him. But it's hard to blame him. Even 21st Christians have trouble understanding all there is about their faith in Jesus Christ, and even more so, 21st citizens have a difficult time wanting to know, why do I need a relationship with this person called Jesus? One pastor had attempted to illustrate the free nature of God's gift of salvation, and he stood in his pulpit one morning, and he pointed to the poinsettia plant, there that was in front of his podium, just like this one is in front of mine. Now, I was raised in a, in a home where both my parents and all my grandparents were Okies. It is okay to call us Okies. Just do not call us ditch bank Okies, okay? Now you're crossing the line. That's very disparaging, all right? Um, it, raised in that family, we always heard this plant as a poinsettia plant, all right? As I got older and around more people with class, I learned it is said poinsettia, all right? So whichever way you say the name of this plant, this pastor used an illustration. And he pointed to the plant and he said, whoever wants this beautiful Christmas poinsettia may have it. All you have to do is come up and take it. There was a woman who was sitting on the front row, timidly raised her hand, and she said, Pastor, I'll take it. He said, great, it's yours. Come on up and get it. But to his surprise... She nudged her son and said, son, go get it for me. No, 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 the pastor said, condition for this gift is you must come and get it personally. You cannot send a substitute. So she shook her head. She was kind of bashful. She said, I don't want to go up in front of the crowd. 
The pastor waited again. It was a gorgeous flower, unusually large, wrapped in red cellophane, gold satin ribbon. It was set in front of the pulpit to brighten their sanctuary during the holiday season. Several had commented how beautiful the plant was. Now it's free for the taking. Someone snickered and said, what's the catch, pastor? No catch, he said, it's free. Nobody moved. A college student said, is it glued to the stand? <laughs> Everybody laughed. No, it's not glued. No strings attached. It's yours for the taking. Well, asked one teenager, can I get it after the service? He shook his head, you must come now. He was beginning to wish he had never started this little illustration. When all of a sudden, a woman from the back stood up, walked forward, quickly grabbed the plant, headed back to her seat before she changed her mind. As she returned to her seat carrying the free gift, the preacher was so excited, he launched with great enthusiasm into his scripture text for the day, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When the service had ended, most of the people left. The woman who had claimed the poinsettia plant approached the platform where the pastor was picking up his Bible, preparing to leave. Here, she said, she held out a piece of crumpled paper in her hand and she dropped it on the table up front. She said, the flower is too pretty for me just to take it home for free. I couldn't do that with a clear conscience. He looked down on that crumpled piece of paper that she had thrown there was a $10 bill. Some of you are saying, Tim, what's the purpose of the story? What does it illustrate? I suggest to you it tells us that people have trouble, particularly in our current culture, of thinking anything is free, especially from God. We need to somehow explain to folks God has given to the world a gift that costs them nothing. There are a lot of symbols during the Christmas season, and many of them represent something Mistletoe, wreaths, candles, they all have a symbolic meaning. I've always admired the beauty of poinsettia plants. They were named after a guy by the name of Joel Poinsett, who happened to be a minister to Mexico. He was a native of South Carolina. He introduced them to America in 1825. In Mexico, this plant is called, and I can't pronounce it in Spanish, but it's called the Christmas Eve flower. It is truly the quintessential Christmas plant. When you see them appear in stores, you know that Christmas is not very far away. Traditionally, that star-shaped leaf pattern is said to symbolize the star of Bethlehem, and the red color represents the blood sacrifice of Jesus for all of our sins. Just as this beautiful plant draws our attention to Christmas, the star over Bethlehem drew the attention of the Magi to bring them to the place where Jesus was. People around us have difficulty understanding that salvation is a free gift that they must receive. You see, our culture wants to earn everything that it gets. We want to clean ourselves up before we come to God. Or some people believe they don't have to come to God on His terms because they've already established their own terms for being good with God. And they believe that they've met those terms they've come up with and yes, they'll get heaven when they die. Or some people simply believe they're not as bad as some folks and certainly better than others, and so they're surely going to make the mark. You see, when we think that way, what we're doing is we're pressing a $10 bill into God's hand and we're saying, see in heaven, God. And Jesus said in John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13, that doesn't work. You can't do it that way. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, I've come to my own, and my own have not received me. But as many who receive me, to them I will give power to become the children of God, even to them who believe on my name, which were born. How? Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but we're born again by God. What does this mean? It means that you can't, you can't come to be a Christian based on your heritage. It doesn't make any difference who your parents or your grandparents were. Just the fact that my grandfather was a preacher and my dad was a preacher and I'm a preacher doesn't mean that either of my sons were going to be a preacher. Just because both sets of my grandparents were Christians and both of my parents were Christians doesn't mean that I was a Christian. 
I was not a Christian until the third Thursday of June in 1960 in a small chapel at Hume Lake Christian Camp where I walked down an aisle and knelt at an altar and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Then I was born again. Up till then, just a sinner who needed a Savior. We can't become a Christian because we've decided that we're good enough. That would be described to Jesus' words as the will of man. And the will of man doesn't determine whether we go to heaven or hell. We can't become a Christian because somebody else has decided for us. Just because my mama wanted me to be a Christian did not make me a Christian. It must be our choice. We must receive the gift and open it. We have to accept the gift on God's terms, not ours. You can't buy this gift. You can't earn it. You can't collect brownie points or green stamps. Only about half of you know what green stamp means, all right? The rest of you all explain some other time, all right? You have to accept God's gift in God's way. And what is that way to receive Jesus? And maybe some of you who've sat in church many, many times, you've never yet really done this. You've never yet opened the package for yourself. This is not complicated. I'm not going to make you come get a poinsettia plant. But I am going to challenge you. If you've never taken these steps, take them today. You can take them sitting in the pew right where you are. Number one, you must believe. Kathy, our neighbor, and her front yard decorations had a new piece to her decor outside. And it's brightly lit word, single word, believe. Right on the corner. John 3.16. If you know it, quote it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, what, believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The second step in this process is, is, is illustrated for us in Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Man, when guilt is gone, you're refreshed. When condemnation for your past misdeeds is taken out of the picture, you are refreshed. When your life has been made white as snow, that is refreshment. Believe, repent. Third step, confess. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God is raised from, from the dead, you will be saved. None of those is a purchase price, but it's the appropriate response that God requests for you and I to accept his free gift. So you and I should realize that people have trouble understanding that God will give them a gift. They have trouble understanding God's idea of what salvation is all about. So that's why we need to realize how important this gift is. That's why we need to grasp how critical and vital it is for people that we know and love to open the gift that has been given. If we are not compelled to tell others about this Jesus that we celebrate, not our religion, but our relationship with Jesus, then we will have a hard time convincing others who struggle to understand what God wants to tell them. We must be driven to overcome our la lack of knowledge of God before we share Jesus Christ. May I just share a quick story that our men on Thursday morning have been studying? The woman at the well, and I don't have time to take you there and read it to you. But Jesus intentionally went to the well for a drink of water when it was a time of the day when nobody would be there that would assist him. But Jesus, being who he was, knew a woman would be there. This was a divine appointment. And the woman of Samaria went to the well at the wrong time of day. They always went in the morning and they always went in the evening. They never went in the middle of the day. Why did this woman do it? Because she wanted to avoid the people of her town. She didn't want to be with the little gossiping biddies of her community. And so she wanted to go alone. Why? Because she had a very checkered past. And when she met Jesus there and she had this encounter with the Messiah and he offered her his unconditional love and forgiveness and she took it, you know what the scripture says? She went off to Bible college so she could learn how to share her faith in Jesus. No, it says she went right back home and found the people she had been trying to avoid 
She went to the very people she didn't want to have contact with. And she said, guys, guys, you got to follow me. I know it's the wrong time of day, but you got to follow me back to the well. And I could hear them saying, why, why, why do we have to do that? She said, come on, I want you to come hear a guy that's going to tell you everything you've ever done in your life. I'm not sure that's a really good evangelistic way to try to get people. Do you want God to tell you everything you've ever done? He already knows it. But boy, no, but somehow it worked for her. And the people followed her out. You see, Jesus had told this woman, ma'am, I, 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 I know you're looking for love, but you're looking for it in all the wrong places. That's the origin of that song, I think. She had had four husbands, and the man she was living with, she was not married to. And Jesus didn't say, go home, dump that dude, go back to the first guy. He didn't say, go get married first. He said, I'll give you water where you'll never thirst again. And she ran right back to town, brought all these people out. And if you read the scripture, it says, many accepted Jesus right then. And if you read on farther, a few more verses, it said, many more came to know Christ. Brand new Christian, checkered past, minimal knowledge. But she could tell everybody her relationship with Jesus. We must be convinced that their very lives may hang in the balance and we have an opportunity to tip the scales. We must be convinced that God believes that this gift was worth the sacrifice that he made of his son for our salvation. You see, God gave, God sacrificed his only son so that we could be saved. It is not a trivial gift. It is not a nice gesture. It was a sacrifice of great love for you and me. Let me wrap this up. One person wrote a poem of how they have reminded themselves of this very fact every Christmas. It finds its root in for God so loved the world that he gave. It's Christmas time at our house and we're putting up the tree. I wished I could find some simple way to remember God's gift to me. Some little sign, some little symbol to show my friends who are stopping by that the little babe was born one day, but he really was born to die. Some symbol of his nail-pierced hands, the blood that he shed for me. What if I hung a simple nail on my shining Christmas tree? A crimson bow tied round the nail as his blood flowed so free to save each person from their sin and redeem us from eternity. I know it was his love for us that held him to the tree, but when I see this simple nail, I'll know he died for me. It may seem strange at Christmas time to think of nails and wood, but both were used in Jesus' life to bring us something good. From manger bed to crown of thorns, to death at Calvary. God used the wood and the nails to set all people free. So celebrate God's greatest gift. Give thanks in Jesus' name. The wood, the nail, the blood-red cord. This is the Christmas nail. It is to be hung on a sturdy branch a branch near a trunk, a branch that will hold such a simple spike without being noticed by well-wishers, dropping by to admire our tinseled tree. The nail is known only to those who understand its meaning, understood by heart that knows its significance. It is hung with thought. The Christmas tree foreshadows the Christ tree which only he could decorate for us ornamented with nails and blood as this the birth of Jesus only is significant because of his death and his resurrection when Shelley and I decorated our front yard last year for the first time in the neighborhood in which we now live there was some intentionality behind it. 
We have two small little hills in our front yard, raised places. On one hill is a blow-up nativity set. It's Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus. On the other little hill are three Christmas trees. Three wooden Christmas trees. For us, it was symbolic of the three crosses that are seen most often on Calvary's cross. Two thieves and Christ. One thief left the gift unopened. One opened it quickly to his blessing and his glory. And the one in the center paid the price. In that middle tree are the stories of the birth and the resurrection of Jesus. I marvel sometimes at people who walk by and they say, look at those three trees. I wonder if there's any meaning to that. And I get the chance to tell them, read the verses. Do you find ways to share the gift of Jesus at Christmas in such a way that others can understand it? Let's pray. If you've never invited Christ in your life, why don't you do that this morning? Believe, repent, and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Use your own words, nothing fancy, no formula, just an honest confession of the soul. If you know Jesus, ask him to give you the eyes to see the opportunities that he'll provide for you over these next 10 days to share the message of Christmas in a very powerful way. Become the woman of Samaria. Father, Thank you for this season. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the greatest gift you've ever given. He came in secret. He died in public humility. But three days later, he rose again with the power of glory, pulsating through everything that he said and every movement that he made and every prophecy he fulfilled. May the power of his resurrection be real and evident to those who are here today. For those who need to invite Christ in their life, open the gift this year and let it be a real celebration of the true meaning and purpose of Christmas. And to others of us, may it pulsate through us with the courage to share with those who seemingly can't understand the free gift of Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Five o'clock today, right back here. Watch our kids.